end when he uh, was anxious or sick, he traveled as kind of a way of healing. Um, and people do that as kind of like self-care today. It might be a similar idea of what he was trying to accomplish. Now, William James was curious uh, about science. His dad uh, pushed him into um, medicine. So uh, he doesn't like medicine. He decides he's going to become an artist now, what's interesting, he comes full circle back to medicine, but whatever. Um, he starts, says, I'm going to be an artist. And ultimately, <clears throat> he flames out. He, he really, he doesn't have the technical skills to be a, a, a good artist. So if that's the case, we need to find uh, another thing. So he enrolls in Harvard, trying to figure out what he's going to do. And it's at this point, he develops serious depression. Uh, and his depression eventually will get so serious that he would contemplate suicide. But, you know, here he is in college, overwhelmed and becoming very, very uh, depressed. So... He, he leaves chemistry, moves to medicine, uh, skeptical of medicine, switches over uh, to biology and then zoology. And then he says, you know what? I'm just going to uh, go back to medicine. So he, like many college students, did not know what he wanted to major in. And he tried a little of this. He tried a little bit of that. Eventually, he returns to medical studies, uh, not happily, but he returns and uh, becomes depressed and travels to a uh, German spa for some respite, tries to write a little bit, uh, becomes very bored and uninterested. Uh, and at this point, before I move on, Listen to what he is. He's kind of like bumbling around trying to find his way. Then he sits in a physiology lecture in the University of Berlin. Now, uh, some of the greatest minds in, of physiology were in Germany at this time, right? So Hermann uh, von Helmholtz, right? Wundt, all of these people were there. Uh, Fechner. Baber, <laughs> all of these great minds. So he's like, well, I, I'd like to learn from Helmholtz and Wundt, never meets Wundt, by the way, eventually returns back to the United States and gets a medical, a doctor degree from Harvard. So that becomes his profession. He is a medical doctor. Um, but it, he doesn't feel himself. He has a whole host of uh, insecurities. I told you that he contemplated suicide. Uh, he was anxious. He was depressed. And, you know, he is very concerned about his welfare. So he checked himself into an institution, which at that time is pretty, pretty bold because the levels of treatment that we had back then in, in psychiatric hospitals was not very much. So none of these treatments work uh, with him. Now, he it develops what uh, James Beard refers to as Americanitis, which is that neurotic American spirit. And uh, they try and explain you know, maybe William James is exper experiencing Americanitis, which is this anxiety or neurosis that comes from, you know, just not being satisfied, not being satisfied in general. Uh, and the more intelligent, self-aware you are, the more likely you're going to be influenced by this. And uh, it also interferes with your professional development. Right, so you have all of this going on, 
you know, and James Beard says, this is Americanitis. So what does he do? He creates the cure. And here's the prescription to, to treating neurosis. And it's gender specific. For males, travel. Do uh, adventure activities. Work out vigorously. And that is going to make you happier. For females, sleep. Go on bed rest. Eat. Enjoy the pleasures of food or a high-fat diet. Now, do these treatments sound reasonable to you? Anyone have a reaction to the treatments? Natalie, what's your take on the treatments? Natalie. Okay. Rosa Maria. I just find it strange how they want their women fat and the men are getting healthier and bettering themselves. Like the women are becoming lazy. They want them to sleep. They want them to eat fatty foods while the men are getting fitter and smarter. I don't think that's going to make a woman feel better about herself, if her, especially if her husband or her partner yeah. Looking nice, has a six pack, has a nice job, is educated, and she's fat, laying in bed all day, not getting anything done. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. We would criticize the idea of gaining weight and sleeping all day because, uh, interesting to note, if I were to give a screener for depression, I would ask, "Have you had any sleep changes? Have you had any weight?" changes. And sure enough, those are symptoms of depression. So what it sounds like George Beard was doing for women was prescribing the symptoms, right? And that to me, in this case, isn't going to work. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't feel good when they take a nap or recharge their batteries. But the idea of laying in bed all day, that's, that's not reasonable. Uh, eating, you know, your favorite food, a delicacy might make you feel good in the moment, but that isn't going to cure depression. So <laughs> this prescription it, you know, by modern standards is ridiculous, right? You can also make a person dependent on that. So like a person that's depressed, there are people that are depressed, associate their depression with food and they overeat or it's the opposite. They could become yeah. anorexic and not eat. And then there are people also that they sleep a lot when they're depressed. They would try to avoid their problems by just going to sleep. Mm -hmm. Right on. And, and I, I appreciate that comment because notice how when I said we screen depression, we don't just ask, have you gained weight? Have you had any significant weight changes? Have you had any significant sleep changes? Because people who are depressed, some people might sleep more, some people might eat more, but there are other people with depression who sleep less, eat less and so forth. So the prescription for women doesn't make sense to me. The prescription for males, in, interestingly, does make a little more sense. Now, travel, travel, you're going to recharge your batteries. If you've heard the term self-care, you know, traveling is a sense of self-care. Adventure, if you're going to do thrill-seeking activities, that's going to release dopamine right? And the, the dopamine that's flooding your system is going to make you feel happier, uh, potentially, right? It's not 100%. And then exercise, exercise is a behavioral intervention for people who are depressed. And what's released there are endorphins. So all of these- happy pills. Say, say what? Endorphins are like happy pills. They make you get yeah. happier and it makes your mood change. That's why they tell people to exercise when they're depressed. Spot on, right? So this prescription kind of makes sense, 
Now, today we have much better treatments for, you know, in, anxiety and depression. Uh, so we look back and all of these recommendations are not the actual treatments, right? Getting to the root of it is probably better. But, uh, but you can see how they might be helpful. Um, anyone ever hear the term runner's high? Jenna, have you ever heard the term runner's high? Yes. So what is runner's high? Um, basically, I think it's mostly people who not really run for sport, but like do marathons. It's like when you're done with it, you feel like you get very energized and you just want to like, I don't know, like I wouldn't say party, but you have a lot of like energy after. Yeah. And I'm going to allow, I see other hands up. I'm going to allow a couple more people to react to it. Gabrielle. What's your take? So I was in track and runner's high is just when you're basically at your quitting point, you, your coach basically will tell you about it. You're going to reach a point where your body's like, stop, stop, stop. And it feels like the end of the world. But if you keep going for like three minutes or whatever your threshold is, you'll find that second wind kind of feeling mm -hmm. and you're energized again and you can beat the race sort of. Exactly. So it's like a block you have to get through. So I, I, I'm going to tie what you said to the idea of the marathon. It usually happens with uh, long distance runners or people who are endurance. Even, yeah. Endurance related. At a certain point, our muscles get fatigued to the point where they say, I want to quit. I want to stop like Gabrielle, you were describing. And you hit a wall and you're like, I can't do this. But if you persist through it, you feel like you're running on air. You're light, you're energetic, you're, you're just floating at that point. Uh, and how does that work? Well, it actually works based on your brain's interpretation of pain. Endorphins are natural painkillers. So here you are, you're running and you're running and you're running. And as you're doing this long distance race, you are tearing muscle fibers, causing some level of pain or, or trauma. And you're, you're, you're causing, I can't do this. I can't do this. But your brain eventually is going to say, I better send some painkillers there. And it sends these endorphins out to alleviate the pain and the high you get is from this endorphins so that you know that i don't know that like floating on air feeling you get from like that crazy intense workout or or endurance workout you know that does improve your mood so that vigorous exercise as it relates in, in endurance and endorphins, as we were saying, kind of makes sense. Now, Rosemary, I saw you raise your hand a couple times, but I kind of kept ranting. So I was basically going to say what you said that runner's high happens when there's an over release of endorphins just because your body is so extra, um, is being like um, you're overdoing it, which happens with marathon runners. They keep going and then um, it's like they don't feel anymore. It's kind of like, um, they say it's like when people are like on drugs, you just don't feel the pain anymore. You keep going and you don't feel that you're running anymore and you keep going. And some people, they have a kick of adrenaline that also happens during that and they get a boost of speed, but they drop sometimes right after that. They lose all their energy. Yeah. How, yeah. Have you ever seen at the end of these marathons, people like collapsing and falling down? Yeah, exactly. That's what happens. And then they have EMTs and EMS come in for those runners. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is interesting. Now, endorphin, the root is endogenous, endo, orphine, morphine. Now, morphine is in the opiate family, right? So if you've ever seen the movie Train Spotting, in the beginning scene where that person is preparing to shoot up heroin, 
and they're doing their routine. When they shoot up heroin, they get that rush. And it, it the, the film did a good job showing that dramatic rush of euphoria. That's what endorphins do too. So if you want to save some money and not get caught in the health risk behavior associated with opiates, do some long distance running. You'll get the same effect. All right, let's see, I see you have someone in the chat. Uh, does it happen with everyone? Uh, it could happen with everyone. It does not happen with everyone because there are people who are going to quit because of the pain before the endorphins are released. Uh, but it, in theory, could happen with everyone, yes. All right, so 1869, William James is trying to, like, put his life back together and he's developing his philosophy about life and he starts thinking about the concept of free will. Now, this is a big deal because there are other people in his day that are, are rejecting free will and people who come after him who are rejecting free will. So people like Freud he didn't believe in free will. He believed in something called psychical determinism. Everything is preordained, right? The mind operates in a predictable way. Uh, there's no choice whatsoever. You're just a, uh, a response to your drives. Behaviorism, you're just a reaction to the environmental stimulus or trigger. So you, you have these different schools of thought, but William James believed in the concept of free will. And he said the first act of free will he would do is to believe in it. Now, will you, this belief set is gonna become crucial with other psychologists at a later point. People like Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers benefit from William James' philosophy of free will, right? So he's starting to get it together and he eventually goes back to Harvard to be a professor. He starts teaching physiology. Now, uh, as you recall, there were no real psych psychology textbooks on the market at that point, right? So he used some of the volumes of Herbert Spencer's work and then eventually writes his own manuscript on psychology. Right. So <laughs> he teaches it and that becomes the first experimental psychology lecture in the United States. So William James gives the first lesson. Now, it's not the first lesson in psycho experimental psychology at all, because we said in 1879, we have the psych lab in Leipzig, Germany, and we have Wundt teaching, you know, almost a decade and a half prior to establishing that lab. So experimental psychology as a whole predates this point, but that doesn't mean uh, that it wasn't a momentous occasion. That's the beginning of uh, experimental psychology in the United States. Now, I do wanna do a caveat. There are some people who argue against this statement and talk about um, uh, G.S. Hall, Granville Stanley Hall. We'll talk about uh, G.S. Hall later, uh, but uh, later in the term, but you'll see that this was one of those ideas. Now, the other cool thing that I like to bring up is William James was not a psychologist, right? He has a medical doctor degree, which means that when he is teaching psychology, he is writing it as he goes. The first lecture William James attended that was related to psychology was his own. So he's developing his ideas and his ideas are pretty profound. Uh, it was this point here that made me want to share with you uh, the article that I did. Um, not because 
of the fact that I did it, but it's remarkable how much William James was able to figure out without any formal education in psychology. All right, so eventually uh, he gets married. Um, it's the wife of his uh, father's choice. So ultimately, you know, he listens to his parents and who he should marry. Uh, and then he gets a uh, publishing contract and he starts writing his first book. It took him 12 years to finish his first book. That is a long time. Now, um, does that happen to writers? Yeah. Um, I am about to come out with a book on immigration that is about four years in the making. So it takes time, but 12 years is a long time. Now, I'll let you know, I have another book that I've shelved on anxiety and depression, which I started before the book that's coming out. So it is possible for a person to really hold on to their work. So if a person becomes perfectionistic in nature, they're, gonna, they're not gonna wanna let that out until they're happy with it. And the problem with being perfectionistic is that nothing is ever perfect. So you're gonna hold on to something longer than you should. And I think that's what happened with William James. I think that happens with a lot of people that are- There's you know, also writer's block. Well, he didn't struggle from writer's block. He wrote a lot, but this, this book seemed to be you know, an issue. Now, 12 years is a long time to have writer's block. I'll tell you 12 years is also a long time to have a publishing contract before they get, get on your uh, nerves and say, hey, when are you finishing, right? So this idea of him taking 12 years is pretty, you know, pretty intense. So he gets married, eventually has children. Children become a source of both anxiety and jealousy for him. Now, this is a common phenomenon for new fathers. It is not uncommon to have anxiety about how good of a, a parent you're gonna be, but also, is this gonna take you away from your work? So there are these anxieties. And then what's also not uncommon is jealousy. Before you have a child, you are your partner's number one priority. Once you have a child, you are at least priority number two, right? And that might be generous because there might be other people ahead of you as well. Now, I always say that once you have children, your partner should be at priority number three you need to be your own priority over your partner even, right? Because, uh, you know, being able to take care of another person starts with you being in a good mental state, being, taking care of yourself. So you prioritize yourself, you prioritize your children, then your, your partner. That's how, how it goes in my mind, at least. All right, so in 1885, becomes a professor of philosophy. By 1889, he gets the title changed to professor of psychology. That's a big deal, right? So now he has this title of professor of psychology. Um, what's interesting is that even though he has this title change, he's still teaching in the philosophy department. And I, I say that, and that's important because psychology was not its own department. Now psychology is one of the biggest departments of all disciplines in any academic uh, institution. It's one of the top four typically, right? You have business, you have nursing, you have psychology, and I'm drawing a blank on, on the fourth one, but um, it's up there. You know, at the College of Staten Island, more than 
of the student body are psycholo psychology students. It's a big college and that's why we have such a large department at the College of Staten Island. Do you know we have about a hundred professors in the psych department? And two thirds, if not more than two thirds of the psych department are adjuncts, part-time faculty. We cannot have our full-timers doing all the courses. We just don't have enough bodies full-time. So it's, it's interesting. Now psychology is one of the biggest disciplines, but at one time we didn't even have our own department. But anyway, uh, we'll get there. In 1890, he eventually publishes his principles of psychology. Remember, Spencer had his own principles of psychology. These principles are William James, right? It's a uh, 12 year effort, as I mentioned. It's a two volume set and it's a tremendous success. Now I recommend a lot of his work, you can find free online. Uh, because they're, it's called Psych Classics. I think York University in Canada has a version of his work. Just read one essay and you will see why William James's work was such a success. The brilliance and elegance of his writing is incredible and thought provoking. So even today, we draw upon it. So if you are... Uh, a neuropsychologist that focus on biology and psychology. He has writings on neurobiology. If you are interested in consciousness and the stream of consciousness, well, he has writings on consciousness, which is relevant to cognitive psychology and so forth. It's just, it goes on and on and on his contributions, learning and memory. Right? We talked about Hermann Ebbinghaus, but memory and learning, he has writings there. So he took a long time, and maybe I actually want to walk back something I said about writer's block. When you think about how he was really writing two books, Rosa Maria, right? So writing two books in 12 years, maybe you're probably right that there was some writer's block. So I, I will walk back that statement if I can. Um, Me, for example, I'm writing four different books. Sometimes yeah. in the middle of the night, I'll have three pages planned out word for word. I'm so tired. I'm like tomorrow morning, I write, I wake up in the morning and I cannot get the same exact thought and it's not as perfect as what you said. And yeah. I'll wait sometimes weeks on end until I could get that same thought or something better than what I was thinking to put it down on paper. So I just realized in that moment, if I have what I'm saying, because I'll be sleeping, my eyes are closed and I see the words while my, everything is black with my eyes closed. And I'm like, oh my God, this is genius. This is amazing. And then the more I wake up and it's all gone. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm curious about what, what you're writing on, what your area of focus is. I'm fascinated. So I'm writing children's books, ABA wise. Okay. Right. I, I'm, I want to be a, I want to get my PhD in uh, BCBA. So I'm, I'm pointing out how children start off nonverbal children, deaf children with pointing and sounding out words with books, make it more visual for them. Right on. Um, that can and, be yeah. So I, I really hope that, you know, whatever you write takes off and, you know, shapes the marketplace a little bit. Um, but if I could give you a piece of advice from a, a person who struggles with writing too, um, write it down even if it's not perfect, just write it anyway. When I have writer's block, and I know we're a little bit in left field, but uh, I'll say it anyway, I write anyway. I say, I'm gonna dedicate an hour today to write. And it, it could be garbage, it could be, beautiful. It could be a paragraph in an, in an hour. It could be three pages in an hour. And I just say, no matter what, I'm going to put something on the paper. Because the more you feed writer's block, 
the more it becomes an aversive condition to even sit down to write. And as someone who's writing on ABA, I'm sure you know you don't want to uh, negatively reinforce uh, not writing. So, but anyway, so I digress. I, I'd love to, I really hope that your book comes out well. All right. So in terms of William James viewpoint about the literature as it is, so um, he criticized Hunt and Titchener. He says, yeah, these are some really nice ideas, great literature, but it's, it's not psychology. So he was very clear that structuralism, volunteerism were not going to be his focus. And he focused more on uh, the adaptive aspects of behavior, right? And hence why I'm talking about him in a lecture on uh, functionalism. So, but the harsh criticisms he had for other people are the same criticisms he had to his own work. So he felt that, you know what, I did this in two volumes, I should have been able to do it in one. So I, you know, the text is just too long, no one's gonna read it. He, he had thoughts or criticisms that maybe what he thinks is a science of psychology isn't really a science, it's a speculative, uh, philosophical entity. And um, he also, due to his depression, was self-critical to the point where he felt that he was incompetent or incapable as a person. So uh, very, very harsh self-criticism, self-doubt. All right, at a certain point, he decides, you know what? I've given all that I can to psychology. I've written the principles of psychology, but I really don't have much more to say about it. So uh, he shifts gears to philosophy. Uh, he talks about religion and spirituality. Again, he was interested in some of these things that psychology was not as interested in. Uh, he had a lab at Harvard University. But as I said, he hated the lab sciences. He was more of like an ideas guy. So when it came to doing his research or being in the lab, he wasn't there. And he needed to hire uh, someone to take over his lab. And the person he hires is Hugo Munsterberg. Now, Hugo Munsterberg, we are going to talk about him as well. And Hugo Munsterberg is an inc incredible genius. And he influences applied psychology in every possible way. But his politics uh, were unfavorable. And eventually, he gets uh, people to turn on him. We'll get there, though. But for a while, the lab is working. Hugo Munsterberg takes it over, and, and things are good. And once he has this, uh, you know, changing of, okay, focus and person to take over his lab, he can focus on philosophy. And in 1890s, he becomes America's leading philosopher. He talks about educational psychology. Now, at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, there was a big boom in education. There was a belief that all children should be able to go to school, which was not the belief earlier. If you were um, in the early to mid 1800s and you lived in a rural community, it is not uncommon for you to maybe get the basic education up to maybe a fifth grade, sixth grade level, and then you work the farm and that became your life. So, but there was a, a uh, shift in ideology in the country that said, no, we need to um, 
focus on our children and focus on education. So it doesn't shock me when he writes this, uh, you know, talk to teachers, giving some coaching as to psychology's role in education. And then eventually uh, he writes the varieties of religious experience. So when we talk about discussions of spirituality and spiritual intelligence and things like that, which, you know, today we have instruments to measure, you know, in the early 1900s, people talked about religion and spirituality. It was only when behaviorism takes a hold of the discipline that from the early 1900s up to about the 1960s, that the discussion of religion and spirituality becomes the taboo. But in James' time, a lot of people talked about religion and spirituality. So it wasn't as much of a taboo. All right, so if we were to think about his principles, uh, many people believe that he's one of the greatest psychologists of all time, uh, certainly one of the greatest American psychologists. His writing, I said, was elegant and beautiful and you know, his ideas are, they carry on to this very day in terms of functionalism and uh, pragmatism and all of these ideas, they resonate even today. And the elements of the mind idea of Wundt and Titchener, they, they just didn't jive. Um, all right. <laughs> so what are the tenets of functionalism? We should study people as they adapt, and we should study the role uh, our bodily functions have in survival, right? So it, let's go back to Wundt. Wundt wanted to do, you know, sensation and perception studies, for, for his version of experimental psychology. And he wanted you to try and build up consciousness or try and use introspection to understand what your conscious experience would be. But that's great. But William James says, okay, so now you know the conscious experience, but you're gonna cap uh, the development there. Instead of asking, well, how do you perceive this rose? It's a much better question, according to William James, to say, why do we see at all? You see? Why, what is the purpose of vision? So instead of focusing on your experience, why do we experience the way we do? And it's clear that whether you say you, you see redness or a rose, you know, that doesn't answer the question why. It answers what the question of what. So what do you see would be Wundt and Titchener. Why do we see would be William James and Functionalist. And the premise of the question of why do we see is the assumption that in some way, we have evolved to see to promote survival. And that's true. If we do research on vision, we know that vision is our primary sense organ for survival as human beings. We know <laughs> that there are more neurons dedicated to the sense or the perceptual experience of vision than all of the other senses combined, right? We know that there are more cranial nerves dedicated to vision than any of the other senses. And I could keep going on. So it's clear that there is a biological wiring for survival and vision is our primary sense, uh, uh, sense our eyes are our primary sense organ and vision is our primary sense. We know that. Not every animal is that the case. 
And what's remarkable is that every animal has its own primary sense that's for survival. And I'll tell you one more thing before I continue, and then this might be the last slide I can get to today. But the reason why vision is our primary sense is because we're bipedal. We walk on two feet. And because we have this kind of like top down look and we could scan our environment, we need vision to survive. If we walked on all fours, like for example, a dog or another species, vision would take a back seat to another sense. And when it comes to dogs, dogs do not have the same developed vision as human beings, but they do have further developed hearing relative to human beings. In fact, <laughs> you may have heard the concept of a dog whistle. Now we use that in political terms as kind of like the subtext that's going on that is kind of, you either hear it or you don't, but there is an actual physical thing called a dog whistle that you blow into. And to the human ear, we can't hear it because the frequency is higher than we can perceive as we talked about uh, hearing, right? When we talked about Helmholtz and Bakashi and all of those researchers, it's beyond our frequency. But dogs have a wider frequency they can hear. Dogs also are wired to be able to move their ears. Now, some people can twitch their twitch ears, their ear. but can we rotate our ears to localize sound? Dogs can, we can't. So they can move their, uh, their in order to hear. So clearly each species is wired for its own survival, right? So do you see where I'm going with this? Because the second half of um, the semester is all about functional psychology in one form or another, whether we're talking about behaviorism, uh, psychoanalysis, humanistic, it's all functional in nature. It's a subfield of functionalism. All right, so that is, uh, hold on, let me see. That's why my dog's ears go back. Yes, that is exactly why. All right, so William James treated psychology as a biological science and he uh, emphasized not just you know what was cognitive, but even the emotions. Now it's interesting that we have a, a therapy model that incorporates the two, right? So if you look at Albert Ellis, it's rational emotive behavioral therapy, which incorporates emotions as part of the process, not just our cognition, not just our thoughts, not just our perception. So um, he emphasized emotions and he comes up, comes up with his own theory of emotions, which we'll get to as well. But in any event, um, our cognitive experience is shaped by our emotions, right? So it is possible that our reaction to our emotions could color our thoughts, right? So um, in therapy, we try and explore, well, what was the, there's the dog. What was the activating event? What was your emotional experience? How did you interpret that experience? That's very much uh, Albert Ellis's approach. But Albert Ellis didn't make that up. He gets credit for the model of therapy, but he benefits from people like William James who says that in, our beliefs are shaped by our emotions and um, our concept formation and reasoning are impacted by our desire and our wants and needs. But that's as far as I can get today. So I'm gonna stop the share, I'm gonna stop the recording and I'm gonna take attendance one more time.